Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning. Um, it is a great pleasure to open the third uh, UW MSR machine learning workshop. We started this workshop, uh, this series, mainly to facilitate the interaction between researchers from UW and MSR. Uh, we were expecting to see the same usual suspects year after year, but uh, the form has expanded considerably. From, from UW alone, we see almost uh, every department being represented here, and we see other universities such as Western Washington being represented here. From Microsoft, we'll see, we see any group, any product, almost everyone is uh, being represented here, as well as other companies such as uh, people from Google, Amazon, Facebook, SAP, Zillow. Uh, we are very glad to have all of you here today. In a sense, we are having a Pacific Northwest uh, Machine Learning Summit here today. Unfortunately, one of the chairs here today will remain unspoken for. Uh, ben Tasker, who was one of the pillars of this community, is not with us here today. Ben was one of the organizers of this series of meetings and was speaking in front of this audience just last year in our last meeting. He passed away unexpectedly just a few weeks after the previous meeting. We will never forget his contribution to this community. We have a busy program for the day. We will spend the morning in this room. Uh, we will hear 10 talks and nine spotlight talks uh, from students. Uh, in the afternoon, we will move to the McKinley room on the other side of this building for a poster session and a reception. Uh, please check the program on our website. You see you have the URL over there. Uh, since the program has changed in the last moment because one of the speaker couldn't make it. Uh, we were lucky to get sponsorship from Azure for Research uh, to award prizes uh, to the best student posters. Therefore, when the poster session uh, starts, we'll open some polls and you can vote for your favorite poster. And we'll gonna announce the winners at around 5.30. Uh, note that not all posters are eligible for the competition uh, due to conflict of interest rules. We try to build a program that will give the opportunity for uh, more people to present their work. We have added the spotlight talks and extended the poster session. We also ask you in your registration form to suggest uh, the titles for paper that have not been written yet. And some of you took it really seriously. And, and during the breaks, we're gonna present this, uh, these titles uh, and you can use them to inspire you for your future studies. I'm just gonna give you a sneak peek. Uh, one of the titles suggests the um, Deep Purple Machine. This is an algorithm for classifying rock and roll music. Or the paper about the empirical evidence against the no free lunch theorem uh, at the UW MSR workshop. <laughs> and indeed, we're going to have a free lunch today. <laughs> it is free for us, but uh, someone in MSR actually signed the check. Thanks, Chris. Uh, if you specified your dietary uh, preferences in the registration form, your lunchbox will be waiting for you at the registration desk. Otherwise, we will have an assortment of lunchboxes uh, out here in the hallway. You're welcome to enjoy your lunch here in the auditorium or take it outside. However, please be respectful of other meetings in this building today. Um, since we have many speakers and full schedule, we'll have to be strict with respect to the timetable. Uh, if you are a speaker, please introduce yourself to the session chair at the beginning of the break before your session starts. Uh, when coming back from breaks, we will signal for the beginning of the next session using the bell and the quack, uh, courtesy of my kids. Uh, when you hear these sounds, please find your way to the lecture room. Uh, we would like to make sure that this is a productive and enjoyable day for everyone. Uh, if you have any issue during the day, please see Sierra at the reception desk uh, or one of the committee members, Marina, Jeff, Sebastian, or myself. I think we've covered all the formalities and we can get started with the real thing. Uh, our first speaker will be Ali Farhadi from UW who will speak about scalable visual recognition. Okay, so good, good morning everybody. Just down. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about scalable visual recognition today. Uh, the stuff that I'm going to be talking about would be basically joint work with a set of wonderful people, Thereshte, Hamid, Santosh, and the last guy, I don't know who he is, but um, probably not here today. <laughs> okay, so let, let me start by showing you the current paradigms of recognition. What do we do in actually recognition these days? Uh, the current paradigm of recognition sort of follows loosely this, this pipeline. We start with a set of categories that we want to recognize. We have our own way of either extracting a hand design features or learn our deep features or discriminative features. And then we have a different ways of actually training a set of different kinds of models for recognizing those categories. And at the end of the day, we have a basically very explicit way of evaluating how well we're doing on benchmark tasks. And each, each year we're actually improving upon the task. And in the last five years, we've actually seen dramatic improvement in the performance of these uh, category recognizers or object detectors over the years. Now, let's look, into the, let's look under the hood, under this pipeline, and let's actually start with the very beginning of this pipeline, where we're going to decide on what are the things that we're going to learn, and how do we actually start this learning paradigm. So well, if you look closely into this paradigm, what's going to happen actually under the hood is that somebody or a group of folks actually have sat down, wrote a bunch of category names that uh, they thought are interesting, image ser basically searched for images of those categories. That's uh, basically my running example would be horse. So we're going to start basically searching for images of horse. People are going to go over each, any of those images, discard non-horse pictures among the retrieved images draw bounding boxes around horses, and that will be basically our way of curating a training set and also a test set for our recognition algorithm. And uh, one problem that we almost always face in recognition, especially in visual recognition, is a well-known phenomenon called intra-class variance. What it is, basically members of the same category might look very, very different in pixel space. So eventually I, wa I may want my recognition algorithm to assign chair to all of these instances, despite the fact that actually they don't look, they don't look much alike in the pixel space. So to handle this intro class variance, we have a pool of different mechanisms. We either try to basically learn features that are robust to this variance, or we build, we build, we build models that can actually handle this much of intro class variance. And to make sure that basically our algorithm, most of the time discriminative algorithms, are aware of what's happening, basically we are, we're going to make sure that we, we're going to feed the algorithm enough coverage of what's actually happening within this category. Meaning that if I want to build actually a really wide horse detector, what I need to make sure is that my horse detector actually seen multiple different cases of horses under different variations. How do we do that? Basically, we ask these people who have actually annotated those images to be creative, come up with different queries to search for other than horse so that we can actually put horses in the context of different things. For example, we might actually search for racing pictures. We might actually search for horses in the beach, things like that to get basically a variety of different kinds of horses. So that's basically under the hood on this pipeline. And that's, that, these two pieces are the two pieces that are going to actually give us a hard time when we try to scale up recognition. When we want to actually go from hundreds of categories, which is what we do these days, hundreds, low thousands, to hundreds of thousands of categories, or actually in my way of talking about it, to anything. But by anything, I actually mean that anything that's visual. So how can I scale this up so that actually my recognition, my recognizer can also learn to recognize about scenes, uh, verbs, actions, emotions, professions, many different, different countries. So how can I do that? How can I learn a recognition algorithm that does not require a human annotation in the pipeline to be able to learn those kind of things? Um, so and. Basically, the question is that how can we learn about anything that's visual? And since we want to actually handle intercast variance, the question that I'm actually asking is how can I actually learn everything about anything? And the bottleneck for us in this process are these two steps. A, 
I need somebody to come up with a list that I can actually expand my query so that I see different varieties of horses. And also, I need somebody to label images as relevant, irrelevant, and draw a box around relevant pieces. In this case, basically, the green boxes correspond to basically the pixels that we believe correspond to horse. And once I do that, basically, the rest of this stuff can actually can follow dramatically. But there are issues. If I want to scale up recognition, I cannot actually stick to that paradigm. Why? Because there are serious fundamental problems with actually having human in the loop. One of them is that I cannot actually ha ask human to be exhaustive or comprehensive in terms of a vocabulary that explains the within class variance. Meaning I cannot actually ask people to list all possible things that can happen to horses that modifies their appearance. It's going to be hard for people and it's going to actually be extremely biased. If I'm, I might be a, a horse uh, expert, and my vocabulary might be actually very different from your vocabulary, and it's very, very hard to actually be comprehensive, almost practically impossible. So that's one fundamental problem, that A, we might be able to actually draw bounding boxes around whatever that you give me, but actually being able to ensure that we, can, we, we have enough intra-class variance in our data set, I cannot rely on human annotated lists. The other issue is that basically some of those vocabularies might be actually category specific. For example, grazing might apply to both sheep and horses, but we do basically, horses do rain, we do like basically barreling with them, horses do roll, I actually didn't know that. Uh, for ships, ships graze, but they don't do any of those things, so hopefully we're not, we're not going to try to basically do raining with horses. We might want to cut, we might want to basically shear ships but hopefully not horses. So th there are different vocabularies that apply to different categories. And actually what makes it even harder is that maybe exact same word like cut might mean very, very different thing with, in different categories. A cutting horse is actually a very specific movement in that sport, but cutting sheep means shearing sheep. And the last, basically to me, the, the most uh, fundamental problem that we have is by adopting the current paradigms of recognition, we are actually committing to an unnecessary hard decision early on. So when we pick ImageNet to actually perform recognition, we're actually adopting implicitly to a very fundamental restriction that we believe that basically the boundaries provided by WordNet are actually visual boundaries in the world. And in most cases, they are not. So in ImageNet, we actually spend a lot of our time recognizing between very specific, very detailed breeds of horses where have we have no clue about, for example, actions or context or parts. So how can we avoid these issues? So basically, we have fundamental issues in scaling up recognition if you want to build automated system. If I want to build a fully automated system, how can I do that? And that's basically the topic of a system that we, we, build, we built uh, at Europe and AI2, it's called Leaven. We call it learning everything about anything. And of course, by everything, I really don't mean everything. And by anything, I really don't mean anything, but a lot of things. Uh, everything that's visual and basically, you're going to see limitations of what do I mean by everything and anything. So how do we do this? So what are the problems? Just to remind you, basically, these two are the problems. How can I be exhaustive in terms of discovering a vocabulary that explains the within class variance? And how can I actually alleviate the need for human annotation in labeling what's in the image, where is the interesting stuff happening in the image? And it turns out that actually uh, the solution to this actually might be uh, using language. If I go to the language and ask basically language resources, what are the modifiers that can ever modify a concept of interest, let's say horse? Well, the answer to this actually can be extracted from textual resources. In this case, we went to Google Books, use Google Ngrams with a little bit of dependency parser on the top of the Google Ngrams. We can actually get a very, very large list of things that can modify a concept of interest. In this case, horse. And we have this list is actually 20,000 dimensional. These are basically sort of almost all of the modifiers that we've ever used in written English about horses in all of the books. 
And of course, not all of them are visual. For example, well, reigning horse might actually be visual, meaning that there is actually a consistent visual signal among the images that corresponds to the reigning horse, whereas the, something like a last horse is actually not visual. There's not much visual structure among the images that returns for the last horse. And I'm not going to go into the details of basically how to, how to deal with this problem. There are actually simple scalable tricks that you can do in an unsupervised fashion to get rid of those. And once we figure out what is usual, what, what is visual, and what is not visual, then the next step is basically learning the model. But we'll still face a problem of intra-class variance. But the nice thing about this is that at this point, my intra-class variance is actually manageable. Why? Because I'm only concerned with learning a model for jumping horses in this case. And when I actually query for jumping horse instead of horse, the set of images for which I actually want to learn a detector or a visual rec or a recognition model actually expose a limited visual variance. That means that actually I might be able to alleviate the need for pruning out the images and provide a bounding box. How can I do that? Well, whatever, whatever is your favorite model learning algorithm, I'm going to introduce a couple of latent variables into that. And those latent variables will basically tell me where the box is in those images. I start with actually the actual box, and basically within the algorithm, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to basically asking the algorithm to go and find to, to find what's common between them. And once I'm tuned to the box of interest, then I can actually learn, go and learn my favorite recognition models, whatever that is, if it's DPM, if it's a deep model, or what, your choice of classifier. And now what's going to happen is that now I'm going to actually learn a different independent DPM model for each of those rows. And I have thousands of those rows, so basically I, am, I end up learning thousands of different category models for just one category horse. And those are basically sort of tuned to all of those lo local modes in the appearance variation within the concept horse. Now, let's see what happens. Actually, I, wanted, I started by building a horse detector. Now I'm in this mess. I have 1,000 detectors for my horse. How do I actually make sense of, out of that space? So you can actually think about this space as a huge, gigantic graph. The nodes are the detectors. I have thousands of those. The edges would be basically the inter-detectors relationships. I can get the detector A running on the tra training set of detector B and vice versa, and cook up a similarity between these things. What's happening in this graph? Basically, there are so many nodes that are very, very similar to each other. And there are nodes that are very different. So what I'm interested in now, I'm facing a combinatorial optimization problem, where what I'm interested in is actually picking a subset of these nodes where, uh, where actually I can maintain a good coverage of the space of visual variance within horses, and at the same time maintain a subset of high quality detectors. And you can actually think about it as a standard basic optimizing for quality and coverage. It turns out that. I'm going to wake Jeff up. A submodular objective function actually works here. Uh, so basically, we have a nice submodular objective function that finds a subset of those nodes that covers the space of visual variance within horses and maintains a set of high quality images. Again, if you're interested, we can talk about it offline. If not, let's actually move on to the result. So basically, what I'm showing to you right now is a set of nodes that actually ended up merged together because of that uh, optimization problem. So the, the, the optimization thinks that basically eating horse and grazing horse should not be two nodes in this graph. I actually should have just one node. For example, a cantering horse and a looping horse should be the same. Uh, angry mob, angry protesters, and angry crowds should be the same. Note that actually we're starting actually walking away, walking outside the boundaries that we were comfortable with in object recognition, which was cat and dog and horse. Now we're actually starting to lear learn phrases, learn detectors for those phrases, and now we're going to actually basically merge them together to have one big mixture model that represents horse or a concept of interest. And once I do that, basically, I have my horse detector, that, and I can actually run it on a variety of different things. Uh, it's, not even, it's, not, it's not objects anymore, right? I can actually start learning detectors for Christmas. So I can basically, my Christmas model has 800 different mixture models within it, including the beard, the tree, the raft, the sheep, and all of those things. Kitchen, standard, because we can have a kitchen pantry detector. We can have a kitchen sink detector. So notice the red boxes are basically the latent variable that I was talking to you about, that basically I'm going to end up converging to that. It might be a country. It might be concepts like electricity. It might be even weird things like DNA. 
So we didn't actually start this with these set of objects. So this is a system that's actually been up and running. It's called Levin. It's actually, you can uh, go to levin.cs.washington.edu. And we started with standard 20 categories in Pascal. We opened it up. And people actually have started submitting queries. And what I'm showing you is actually the right or the left top corner, right top corner of the page. So right now, Basically, people have started expanding the models, and right now we have almost 115,000 different detectors in this model. Annotated more than 100 million images, uh, and provided basically more than 22 uh, or 23 million annotations. And the DNA, electricity, and all of those weird concepts are actually entered by users of this system. So next time you want to actually learn the object detection model that needs to expand the coverage of the, of the visual variance within, this, within categories, Basically, I recommend trying uh, uh, Levin. So now that I have this scalable recognition models, basically I'm going to showcase two neat applications that comes out of a scalable recognition system. One of them is basically uh, a, a segmentation model. So segmentation is basically a problem of figuring out which pixels correspond to the object of interest, which pixels does not. Basically, a finer rep representation other than the bounding box but requires extensive supervision. When I want to do segmentation, what I typically need to provide in my training set, I need to provide exact masks, boundaries of objects of interest to be able to perform segmentation. But with actually web-scaled recognizers that are carefully and semantically grouped together, what I can do is I can actually end up with clusters of basically really well-aligned set of images. And once I actually have these kind of things, I can actually reformulate the segmentation pipeline. And now my segmentation pipeline looks like basically go within any of those semantically constraints, group of well-aligned set of images, perform a co-segmentation, meaning that automatically without any supervision, figure out what's coming between this group of well-aligned images. This in practice is not possible, but in those set of carefully curated images automatically, this is actually possible. Maybe I can actually go ahead and segment out what is common between any of those groups, and now for horses, I'm going to end up with thousands of different segmentation masks. Now, when you give me a new image, what I can do is basically I can figure out where in this graph actually your image appears and use the corresponding segmentation map, pull them together to perform a segmentation. And now, actually, we can actually take segmentation to a next richer level, because now our segmentation masks are not just cats and dogs. We can automatically, without supervision, or without explicit human supervision, we can start segmenting things like a sad dog, a running dog, a hoof of a horse. With, uh, notice that basically there is basically no explicit human supervision. The system can actually go ahead and learn it off the web. Why? Because basically the images are grouped together carefully using semantic constraints. And now we can actually go ahead and image and segment ImageNet without any explicit supervision. So what I'm showing you is basically images, the state-of-the-art segmenter in ImageNet that is supervised, and our stuff, which is basically not using, seg using any kinds of supervision. And that means that basically we can figure out what pixels corresponds to what objects without explicit supervision, but just being careful about how can I use web images. So that's the, one, the, one, that's the first application that I wanted to talk to you about. The second application that basically requires uh, scalable recognition is actually whiskey. Unfortunately, not this kind, this kind. We're still working on them. We haven't get good results yet. But basically, these kind of whiskeys. So whiskey is a system, is a knowledge extraction system that is based on visual information. So later in the afternoon, I'm actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure Larry's going to talk about the importance of actually common sense knowledge and recognition. Why do we need to extract common sense knowledge? And why is this useful? I'll leave that part to him. But basically, what I want to talk to you about right now is that basically, the knowledge extraction is an important problem. People in language processing have been studying this problem carefully for years, have been dramatic improvements over the course of years. But there are some pieces of knowledge that are really hard to get out of text. Why? Because A, they're not frequent enough. B, they typically actually appear in a convoluted form or a very complex syntax, sentence structure that makes it really hard for actually parsing or semantic understanding to work on them. And Visky actually aims at extracting the knowledge of the word hidden within pixels. So if I ask you, do you guys think that do dogs eat ice cream? 
Answers. Somebody says no. Somebody says. So, you, so Ryan believes yes, right? How do you say yes? So basically, you've seen them actually eat ice cream in the real world. And if you haven't, how do you verify this? Well, you have two choices, right? You have computers in front of you. Well, go to Google and start reading documents on dogs, the dietary restrictions, and figure out if they eat sugar and milk, and maybe if you figure out they actually might eat ice cream. Or go, go to Google Images or Bing Images and just search for dogs eat ice cream. And what you're going to see is something like that. And when I show you this, you're actually confident that, yes, dogs do eat ice cream. Why is that? Because you're going to see the dog. You're going to see the ice cream. You're going to see the ice cream in the right end of a dog. And dog is actually in the, in the eating position. <laughs> right? So these are basically, you have, you're using two very important cues to do that. One is appearance models. The other is very careful of spatial relationships between them. And that's the essence of Visky. Basically, Visky is a fully automated system that basically the input to Visky is a textual query like do dogs eat ice cream, do snakes lay egg, do men write elephant, whatever you want to like in a simple lang linguistic form. And the output is basically the score that says how much do we believe actually this statement is true based on the consistencies that we get out of the visual recordings of the ph this phenomena on the web. How do we do that? Basically, uh, the way that we do is basically, let's start with the running examples of do bears fish salmon or not. Basically, the input would be this query. We're going to go to the web. We're going to go to the 11, basically. Learn in an automatic fashion very different set of detectors for all possible combinations of these, actually, these detectors. I have two minutes. I'm going to actually go fast. So basically, I learned the detectors for all possible combinations of salmon, bear fishing, sam fishing salmon, and bear fishing salmon detectors. Then I basically designed this uh, factor graph that basically is concerned with the spatial relationships between these detectors. And to me, a score that I can assign to basically a statement would be the most probable explanation of this factor graph. And at the end of the day, I, I do the most probable explanation. And that gives me a score. That score tells me that how much visually I believe this phenomenon is true. And basically, using that, you can actually just, it's a, it's a fully automated system. You type in a statement, here it comes the score. So what I'm showing you is a set of random statements. The x-axis is basically the confidence score out of the MP MPE. And basically, the green means tr actually true statement. The red means wrong statement. I would like to see green statement on the top, red statement at the bottom. Unfortunately, it's not always the case, but basically, it's sort of like that. On the top, we see things like horse draw carriage, person ride horse, uh, horse uh, hen lay egg. And at the bottom, we see things like man, man ride sheep, uh, horse eat bone, uh, horse lay egg, and things like that. Basically, that would give me a, a way of verifying statements, and I can actually start walking into the state of actually answering questions. Now that I can actually enumerate all of those things automatically, I can start answering, answering questions like, what do dogs eat? The top row is basically what comes out of Visky. The bottom row is what comes out of a language model. For example, the, the, the vision-based system thinks that dogs eat rabbit, sorry, grass, fruit, cheese, cake, food, not, and of course breakfast, and bone. And the language-based model thinks that basically dogs eat contest, grass, cat, food, bone, watermelon, dinner, man, and meat. And I can actually start asking questions about basically different things. What kind of animals lay egg? A turtle, a snake, a frog, a bird, uh, unfortunately a bird, cat. And the language-based model believes that basically a hen lay eggs, and the rest of them I actually don't read. Um, OK, so let me wrap it up. So basically, what I believe is that the next, actually, future of recognition would be in the scalability. So we need to rethink the pipeline of recognition with actually scalability in mind. And we have to make sure that we understand every detailed pieces of actually recognition algorithm to be able to, uh, to, to scale things up. Visual knowledge extraction is actually a byproduct of scalable recognition. We're going to see many, many appearances of actually these kind of research within research community, with vision research community, hopefully sometime soon. So if you're interested in any of those topics, basically, we're actively pursuing these topics at UW and also at AI too. So talk to me if you're interested. Thanks, Sean. I have a question. Sure. So 
in your first part of your talk, you, you talked about um, get, getting the, the data for training. But how do you test accuracy? Right, so you have the same problem. Yeah, so the, it's actually a very good problem question to ask. So we, in, within, within recognition community, the, the bad news is that we honestly don't know how to evaluate larger scale recognition. We still have our limited benchmarks like ImageNet and things like that. So one thing I can do is I can actually go off to web, learn my detectors on the web, and just test it on standard benchmarks. And I didn't basically want to bother you with the details of, actually, of the evaluation, but we have those kind of evaluations. So basically there's the scale over recognition is are sort of on par with supervised methods. It's not the best detector that you can get, but it basically scales to everything. But how can I evaluate it in large scale? Actually, there is, there is no elegant solution. So we can turkey it, and then we can basically can start walking to the paradigms that we already have for the benchmarks. But that's, this, that's the way that we actually do these things right now. Is this the best way? Unfortunately, no. Make sense? Uh, question. So you probably get this question a lot, <coughs> but um, given you know the fact that the population of the planet is seven billion and it's growing by about a billion people every ten years, uh, I mean the obvious answer, question is why not? Why can't you use crowdsourcing to essentially get everything, especially given the ubiquity of network access and everybody has devices and can s solve small captures perpetually on their portable devices to to do annotation tasks and and maybe maybe unlike what you said at the beginning, maybe it's actually quite possible to get all of these different categories and the fact that there are different semantic meanings for, diff for the same tags for different objects doesn't necessarily cause any problems. It just means that the matrix is sparse. Got it. So there are actually uh, several questions within that question. So one of them is that, well, there are actually, if I open up a dictionary, there are roughly in the order of 300,000 words in it, right? So w if it's 300,000, why can't we just ask Google to annotate everything in that? There are issues, right? So one of them is that for, if you're human annotator, it's actually sort of very hard to be ex uh, comprehensive and exhaustive for within class variants. That's one problem, but the actual problem that we're... The question is why, is why necessarily is that the case? Because given that there are so many people who potentially are going to be in the future willing to annotate, why necessarily is that true? I don't see why that's mm. necessarily true. So one, 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 yeah, one, one, one approach to that problem would be basically just scale it up across annotators so that each person might not be exhaustive, but a collection of actually uh, annotators can be exhaustive. And the issue basically, these kind of paradigms would fall apart when we go into the space of combinations. Because as you see, basically, we're going to go to the phrases, and we're going to go to the longer phrases. And now, not only I don't need to, I, don't, I do have to basically annotate 300,000 or a million different objects in the world, but I also I need to start basically labeling combinations. And that's where things actually get unmanageable, even on mechanical Turk or even with Google budgets. Because then you cannot start basically annotating all possible combinations within million entities. And that's basically where, where the scale, well, basically fully automated systems comes handy. Speaker once again. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Salima Mirshi, and she's going to talk about uh, usable machine learning. So hi, um, thanks Rani. Um, uh, as Rani said, my name is Salima Mershi. Uh, I am a researcher here at Microsoft Research in the CHILL group, which stands for Computer Human Interactive Learning. And today I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that our group is doing, um, along with a, several other collaborators at MSR, on how we can work towards more usable machine learning. OK, so what do I mean by usable machine learning? So when we think of machine learning, we often think about it in terms of the problem that machine learning algorithms are trying to solve, which you know, at the most ba basic level is something like this, right? where you're given some data, and the goal is to learn a function that can predict the labels on new data. Right, this is at least for supervised machine learning. However, in the practice of machine learning, what actually happens is there's this guy. Right? There's a guy who is responsible for collecting some data, creating some features, tweaking parameters, and then sending all of that information to a machine learning algorithm in order to learn the function. And you know, this is an iterative process, usually, in the, in the sense that this guy's not going to get it right the first time. Right? He typically has to somehow inspect the algorithm's performance and then try to improve the model um, by supplying it with more and more information until it's working the way he wants it to. 
So this is you know, sort of typically how we use machine learning. And this guy here you know, really is you. you know. Well, well, this guy's Ronnie, but like he, you know, as one of the workshop organizers today, you know, he represents people in this room, you know, the people in this room who use and interact with machine learning algorithms every day. So, you know, while we talk about advances and when we talk about advances in machine learning, we're often talking about how we can improve, you know, machine learning algorithms. Because people are so integral to the machine learning process, there's also, also a really important opportunity to advance machine learning by improving the abilities of the people who are interacting with and using machine learning algorithms every day. So this is what I'm going to talk about um, today. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how we can you know, help this guy, which you know, I will stop picking on Ronnie, you know, really how we can help people like you better use and interact with machine learning. And you know, there are many sort of interaction points between users and machine learning systems, you know, from collecting data to labeling to featuring. And so there are many opportunities to improve the interaction here. But today I'm just going to talk about a couple of them. I'm going to talk about labeling. Um, so this is actually very related to the previous speakers um, talk about how to, how to label uh, data appropriately and uh, performance analysis. Okay. So labeling. So um, as the previous speaker has talked about, you know, people are often recruited to manually label large data sets. Um, and then those data sets are then used to train machine learning algorithms. The problem is that labeling is not really as easy as it seems. So when people are labeling data, they're trying to label data according to some target concept that's in their heads. Right? So imagine I was you asked to label web pages as being related to cooking or not about cooking. So what I would do is, you know, I'd start labeling some examples that, you know, are clearly about cooking. So these examples, you know, contain recipes, so they clearly have to do with cooking. Then I'd label some neg negative examples, examples that are clearly not about cooking. Um, so these d definitely don't have anything to do with cooking. But then what if I came across an example that looked like this? Right? This page is, you know, about catering, which, you know, is kind of like cooking because it's about sort of preparing food. So maybe I'll say, you know, yes, this is about cooking. So then I'd you know, keep going, I'd keep labeling some positive and neg negative examples. And then I might come across another example that's kind of like that catering page, right? This is about you know, some chef coming over to your house and cooking for you. So at this point, you know, I might say that, well, you know, this is actually not about cooking. It's not really about like, me learning how to cook or, or cooking myself. It's about someone else cooking for me. So I'm going to say, no, this is not about cooking. So that's the problem. Right? The problem is that I just labeled this page as not about cooking, but what about that previous page? Right? Where did I put it? You know, do I need to find it? Are there other pages like that that now I need to find and move and, and change my labels for? The problem is that the concept that I'm labeling for is evolving as I'm looking at data. But the tools that we have to label don't easily allow us to revise and refine our concepts as we go along. And you know, this was just a few examples, so you can imagine how difficult it might be if we have hundreds or thousands of examples to label. Um, in fact, we actually did a study where, to investigate how much of a problem this concept evolution problem was, where we had nine machine learning experts label the same set of data in two sessions about four weeks apart. And what we found was that even machine learning experts were only about 80% consistent with themselves um, from one labeling session to the next on the exact same set of data. And in fact, six out of the nine people's labels changed significantly from one labeling session to the next. So in order to try to sort of help people with this concept evolution problem, we came up with an interaction technique that we call structured labeling, where we essentially allowed people to explicitly organize their concept via grouping and tagging within a traditional labeling scheme. Okay, so let me show you what this looks like. So, so this is sort of the traditional labeling scheme where we sort of force people to categorize data at a high level. Um, and we re repl replace it with something like this, where we allowed people to create subgroups within these high level categories. Okay, so for example, if I came across this catering example and if I was unsure about what to do with it, what I would do is create a subgroup about it. Um, and then I could tag that group and say, you know, this is about catering. So I could remember how I labeled examples of that kind. So what this does is that it sort of surfaces my labeling decisions to myself so that later on, you know, when I came across that other example that was kind of like catering, I can group it together. I can say, you know, this, you know, actually is, a same, is part of the same subgroup. And then later on, you know, if I do want to revise my concept, I can easily go back and do that um, by moving this whole subgroup at once and changing what I consider as part of my concept of cooking or not. 
Um, so these groups and tags not only sort of you know, let me recall and revise my labeling decisions as I go along, they actually let me defer my decision making, right? Which is kind of important, right? Because a lot of times people agonize about how to label data. You know, is this, pay, this catering page about cooking or not? Is this horse you know, really about horses or is it you know, not really something I want to consider uh, as part of my concept? Um, but what this does is it allows people to sort of tag things that they're unsure about and then change their minds um, later on as they observe data. Um, so we also came up with an assisted version of the structured labeling tool where um, based on some pilot studies that we had done with um, a, an early version of the, of the system. And um, we noticed a few problems. So first of all, we noticed that people didn't always provide tags um, when they came across groups that they wanted to, to put in subgroups. Um, but then you know, later on when they wanted to remember what was in each of these subgroups, then they'd have to manually go in and look at them and that, that was you know, a big pain. So what we did was we added automated summaries to the groups um, based on the items that people grouped together. So in case they didn't tag it manually, we, they could help, we could help them recall what they put in each group. We also found that when people were labeling, they'd often you know, remember creating groups of similar items. So if they, if they came across an item, they'd remember like, oh, I saw something like this before, but I don't really remember where I put it. Um, so what we did was we provided recommendations of where they should put these groups based on item similarity. So you, you measure the similarity between the item you're currently trying to label and all of the previous groups. And then we recommended um, which group to put, it, to put these items in using this little sort of star. Uh, we also found something interesting was that people didn't want to you know, make labeling de decisions or didn't want to put an effort in making labeling decisions for items that they thought were outliers. So you know, if you thought that you know, if there was only like one catering example in all of my data, then maybe it doesn't really matter where, whether I label it as positive or negative. But if that example is very you know, representative of some concept that I want my model, model to really recognize, then you know, I'd probably want to put in more effort to label them correctly. So to help with this, we, what we did was we showed people similar examples to the page that they were currently trying to label. So then they could recognize whether it was part of, if it was part of a larger concept, then they could decide whether or not it was worth sort of structuring their labeling for. So we did an evaluation. Uh, we had about 15 people come in. Um, we you know, did it within subject design. We had them use each of the different tools, this traditional labeling, um, manual labeling, and structure, uh, manual structured labeling, and then the assisted version. We had them do three different tasks, you know, did all the counterbalancing, all that. And what we found was that people in, did, in fact, use structured labeling when it was available. We found that people created groups and revised their, their labels significantly more with the structured labeling tools than with the traditional tools. So that means that they were, they were allowed to evolve their concepts more easily with the structured labeling tools. We also found that people labeled consistent, more, significantly more consistently with the structured labeling tool and preferred it over traditional labeling. And they stated things that you know, it helped them organize their concept and decide what was part of their concept and not, and helped sort of reduce the cognitive load, um, a cognitive burden sort of of the traditional labeling task. So, so this is just you know, sort of one example of how advances in our interfaces and tools can actually really help people better interact with machine learning algorithms. Um, and so now I'm going to talk about, switch gears a little bit and talk about a different example, um, which has to do with sort of another critical step in the, interact, in the machine learning process, which has to do with performance analysis. So with performance analysis, the idea here is that the performance that you see in each iteration of model building should really directly influence your subsequent actions. Right? That's the whole idea, right? If, if your model is performing poorly, you're going to try to figure out what's happening and you're going to try to fix it. The problem is that most of the time what we see uh, at this stage is this, right? Some, some number that summarizes the overall performance of your model. The problem is that, you know, what does that really tell you, right? It can sort of signal that there is a problem, but it doesn't really tell you anything about, you know, where those problems are or what you need to do about them. And even if you're lucky and if you have several summary statistics or different you know, charts and a standard you know, performance metrics, charts and graphs like precision recall curves, you know, all of these techniques will convey the existence of errors, but they don't tell, help you figure out where those errors are and what you need to do about them. Um, in order to do that, what you usually then have to do is go to a different tool or switch to a different mode and actually pull up your data to look at it uh, and try to gain insights of where the problems might be. 
So the problem here is that the switching between looking at summary statistics and different tools for looking at your actual data can actually be really disruptive to your primary task, which is actually to build your model. Right? And in fact, there was a study done, a joint study actually, by um, people from both UW and MSR, um, where they studied this and they, they found that um, this, this having to switch between summary statistics and looking at your data was actually shown to discourage people from looking at their data and actually led, them, led to a, a more trial and error approach to model building, where people were essentially randomly trying to tweak parameters of their models or change features in order to make these summary statistics go up. Um, and then, then they would only sort of look at their data to do any error analysis when those trial and error approaches failed. So what we wanted to do here was sort of come up with, try to come up with a, a way to encourage people to more regularly look at their data during model building. And so we came up with a tool which we call Model Tracker, which I will attempt to demo. So let's do this. All right. Okay. So um, this is Model Tracker. The Model Tracker is down here at the bottom. Um, and I'm going to show you this in the context of a system we call ICE, uh, which is an interactive classification and extraction platform that our group here is developing at MSR. Um, and I, now I won't be able to talk about it in a lot of detail, but just for the purposes of this talk, you just need to know that up here is sort of where a person would label data. So I can label these as positive or negative. And over on the left here is where I could sort of add features. <laughs> So in this case, I've actually already created a model. I've already trained a classifier to recognize whether web pages are about cycling or not cycling. Uh, and I've given my system about 511 examples and about six features at this point. Now, in ICE, what we used to have um, is this at the bottom here. This is sort of the standard summary statistics and graphs that you might see in order to try to understand the performance of your model. So we'd have people look at this and then if they decided that maybe there's a problem, then they would switch to a review mode and then try to sort of figure out where those problems are. They might sort of you know, sort or, or filter by error, errors and then try to look at their errors to try to gain some insights about what to do. So what we wanted to do is sort of like encourage people to more, to more easily look at their data. And so we replaced all of the summary statistics and graphs with um, this visualization um, here at the bottom. So I'll explain what the visualization is showing. Um, so each of these little boxes here corresponds to an example that I've already labeled. So in this case, I've, I've labeled 511 examples. So there are 511 boxes here. The color of the box is the uh, label that I gave. So if I said something was positive, it'll be labeled green. If I said something was negative, it'll be labeled red. And now the boxes are laid out horizontally according to my classifier's score. So um, low scoring items are on to the left and uh, high scoring items are to the right. So what that means is what I want this visualization to look like is that I want all my green boxes to be on the right and all my red boxes to be on the left. Right? That would mean that, that my system is very much agreeing with what I said. So what this is doing is it's actually showing you performance, right? It's actually showing you not only like where the system is performing well or where it's agreeing with you, it's showing you your errors, right? It's showing you these, the red boxes over to the right are false positives, the green boxes over to the left are false negatives. So it's showing you your errors. And you know, unlike with um, standard performance statistics and graphs where all errors are sort of treated equally, um, this is actually showing you also the severity of your errors, right? So the very egregious errors are the ones that are at the far end of the visualization um, because that's where the system and you very much disagree. Uh, and that's in contrast sort of the, the, to the errors that sort of are in this uncertain middle area. So what this allows is that it allows me to actually directly access my errors because I'm actually showing the individual examples here. So I can actually click on these boxes. So I can click on these errors. So let's look at one. So, so this is a false negative. It's a green box that has a very low score. I'll click on it and I can click on it and it's directly brought up to me. So I don't have to go find where my errors are and try to understand what the problems are. So I clicked on it and it's actually brought up for me. Um, and so, you know, if you recall, I was trying to create a classifier that can recognize whether web pages are about cycling or not. Um, I actually labeled this as positive, but it's actually, a, it's a recycling page, not a, not a cycling page. So that's actually a mislabel on my part. So what I can do is I can easily go ahead and, and fix it and update my model. Um, and then my system will retrain um, and then show me the results um, after fixing that problem. So, um, by doing this, we're not only allowing people to see their performance, but we're allowing them direct access to the errors and letting them prioritize their efforts in debugging. 
Now, this visualization actually subsumes the, the same information that you would see in all of these um, traditional summary statistics and graphs. So for example, confusion matrices, which show you agreements and disagreements. There, that, you know, like I said, is what we can already see in Model Tracker. We can see the agreements are the green boxes to the right, red boxes to the left, and disagreements are the red boxes to the right and green boxes to the left. But unlike with confusion matrices, which are threshold dependent, meaning that if you wanted to see what your agreements and disagreements were at different thresholds, you'd actually have to change a threshold and create a new uh, a confusion matrix. Model Tracker is actually threshold independent, meaning you can see the accuracy, you can see the agreements and disagreements at all thresholds simultaneously. Um, and you, you can see what the threshold is. So we have a vertical line to show you what the current threshold is, but that really just serves as a, as a visual aid to the user. Because you can see that if, you know, I, if I increase my threshold, um, I have fewer false positives because there are fewer red boxes to the right of the line, but it's clearly at a cost of my false negatives because I have a lot, lot more green boxes to, uh, that are to the left. Similarly, we can also see precision and recall. Right? Precision is just um, the proportion of red boxes or green boxes that are to the right of this line. Right? So in this case, you know, I'm doing pretty well in precision because most of the boxes that are above the threshold are green. There's a few red boxes. But I'm actually doing pretty bad on recall because recall is the number of green boxes that are to the right. So there's a lot of green boxes that my system is unable to see that are to the left of the line. So I can see that um, if, I, you know, increase, if, I, if I decrease my threshold, I would be increasing my recall, but clearly at a cost of precision because now also more red boxes are to the right. So we're showing you the same information you'd see in all the summary statistics and graphs while allowing you direct access to your data. Um, okay, so um, there's a lot more that we can do with Model Tracker. There's a lot of like annotations that you might be seeing here um, because we're showing things at the item level, but I won't be able to talk to you about that today. But there's a lot of things you can do to help people sort of um, uh, debug um, the problem, their, er their individual errors uh, by using a display like this. Okay, so. Let's get back to the talk. Okay. So that was Model Tracker. Um, we did a couple of evaluations with it um, to see sort of how people used it and whether or not you know, it helped them. First, we did a six-month field deployment where we had real users. So by real users, I mean people sort of outside of our group who were using ICE with Model Tracker um, for, real, for building real models, so for both research and product deployments. And what we found was that um, model track, people use model trackers, they use it in 35 out of their 40 sessions. And they, more importantly, they use it through, when they were using it, they use it throughout model building. So this chart shows you how often people interacted with model tracker throughout building a model. And so they're interacting, they're, they're clicking on these boxes, they're looking at their data throughout model building with a slight increase uh, in interaction towards the end. Uh, we also did a controlled experiment where we sort of looked at when people were looking at their data, were they still able to sort of debug errors as they would um, if they were just able to sort of sort and filter um, their, the, their already labeled data. And what we found was that people preferred model tracker, preferred, preferred interacting with it without a loss in debugging ability. Okay, so this is really what we want. We want people to look at their data more regularly, and when they look at their data, we still want them to be able to debug and gain insights from, from what's happening so that they can take a more informed approach to model building. Okay, so these are you know, just a couple of examples of where advances in interfaces and tools can you know, really impact uh, our ability to interact with and use machine learning algorithms. But there, there's a lot more opportunities in the space. You know, uh, the other examples of things that our group are working on is on the data collection side. You know, how can we help people sort of effectively explore large data sets so that they can find a variety of data um, to teach their system about so it can generalize better? You know, featuring is another thing that we've been looking at. It's like, how do we help people come up with these new features that might help their them build their models. There are a lot of open problems in this, in how we can sort of help people better interact with machine learning algorithms. And you know, you know, I really only focus sort of on the interface side of this problem, but really, like you know, advances in interfaces on the interface side can really go hand in hand with advances in algorithms, right? The insights that we gain from understanding users can really impact machine learning algorithms, and vice versa. So I think there's you know a lot of opportunities for collaboration and for a user machine learning partnership. So thanks, at this point I can take questions. What kind of stuff can you do with model? 
What kind of stuff can you do with Model Tracker if you have, say, more than 500 data points, like you know, a few million for right. a lot of these image sets? Yeah, so so we built Model Tracker for ICE, where it's, a, it's an interactive uh, machine learning platform, so people usually collect about 500 to 1,000 labels. Um, we also use it for entity extraction at, in ICE, which is, can amount to about 10 times as many labels because you have it at the token level. And for that, we use subsampling, so it's only to show you a sample of the data. We're also sort of exploring um, some grouping, so instead of showing individual examples, we can show sort of group of examples so that you can scale um, to, to larger data sets more easily. Uh, so is the software available? Um, uh, we're hoping to, to be available somewhat sometime soon. <laughs> yes. Hi, I was curious how you deal with uh, bias in the label recommender. Um, so when we uh, helped people to to help people group them right. similarly, yeah. So it was interesting. We found that people um, people felt that the the grouping recommendations turned their labeling task into a verification task. So instead of deciding how to label, they would just verify whether the recommendation was correct or not. Um, and oftentimes they actually just went with the with the recommendation as opposed to sort of deciding on their own. So so it, it may be causing some of that. Um, and we haven't actually looked at like a, how that impacted the performance in any way. Yeah. For the structure learning, um, you showed results for label inconsistency. Um, do you have accuracy results? Like how helpful is that to be more consistent? Um, yeah, no. So we, we, we measured consistency as, um, so we had, we looked at the pairs of items that people put together and whether or not those items should have been together based on some ground truth data. We didn't actually build models with them because the models you would need, we would need features along with that and the features you would create for the different type groups might be very different and we would want to have the users be involved in what features they were going to use. So we didn't actually build the models but we looked at just the consistency of the labels that they're providing to the system. Cool. And sorry, just another question. For this last visualization, how would you do it if you had like multi-class classification? Yeah. Um, this is a good question. Um, we actually use it also for multi-class, um, for, for entity extraction, which can be thought of a hierarchical multi-class. And for that, we turn multi-class into like a binary classification. So one class is versus all the rest. Um, it's not necessarily ideal. I think there are ways that we can improve it so we can show all of the classes at once, and we're looking into that. Um, but right now, we've been using it for, by turning it into binary, and it seems to be, people are still seem to be using it. We have our first uh, Spotlight presentation uh, by Tyler Johnson. Hi, so my name is Tyler and today I'm talking about Blitz, which is a very fast and principled algorithm for solving uh, convex optimization problems involving sparsity. This is joint work with my advisor, Carlos Gastron. Okay, so here's a convex objective involving sparsity. It's very famous, um, the lasso problem. We have squared loss in this L1 regularization term. And we know a lot about this problem. Um, for one, the solution is sparse. So the solution has many values that are exactly zero. We also know how to solve this problem using methods like coordinate descent and gradient descent. And there have been a lot of uh, papers in recent years uh, improving this method using words like stochastic, parallel, proximal, accelerated, and dual. Um, we understand these methods very well at this point. But all these methods have a problem, and that problem is that they treat all the features equally in the problem. And we're doing feature selection, so the features are inherently not equal. Um, all of the features with value zero are in fact irrelevant to the solution. So what the fastest solvers do is they use something called working set methods. And the idea is very simple. You first choose a small set, subset of variables that you believe are likely to be relevant. And then you optimize only over these chosen variables and ignore all the other features. And then once you converge on the subproblem, you repeat the process until you converge globally. So this works very well in practice, and the fastest libraries use this very successfully. But there are a lot of questions to be answered about this problem. Which variables do we choose? How do we know we're selecting a good set of variables? How many do we choose? And how, do, how long do we converge for each subproblem? 
These are all questions that are not answered adequately by current theory. So what we've done is we've proposed splits, which is an algorithm that does have such theoretical guarantees. It makes progress in all of these areas. So we, th we select a theor theoretically justified uh, subproblem. We can apply our theory to optimize the convergence criteria for the subproblem and how large it should be. We also have a method for progressively discarding variables as the algorithm runs. So it's kind of like pre-screening, but you can do it um, as you uh, progress in convergence. And most importantly, this algorithm converges extremely fast in practice. We have a lot of results from a single machine setting, also um, out of core learning, and also in the distributed setting. And we um, hit or beat state of the art in all these settings. So if you're interested in this, please see me at my poster um, about Blitz later in the day. Thanks. So supervised learning has been one of AI and machine learning's greatest success stories. So it's really not surprising that everyone's been trying to use crowdsourcing to label their training data in order to train really powerful classifiers. Now the problem with crowdsourcing is that the workers are noisy. So what people generally do is they ask multiple workers to label each example and then use some sort of label aggregation function to figure out what the true label is given the multiple noisy ones. Uh, this label aggregation function can be something like majority vote or something like uh, some, some work that the machine learning community has output in the last couple of years. Um, but all this leaves one crucial question unanswered. And that question is how do we best direct labeling effort in order to maximize the accuracy of the classifier, not the accuracy of the training set? And to that end, I want to talk to you a little bit about our efforts in what we're calling React active learning, which is a generalization of active learning uh, to the setting of label noise. And so, so what is active learning? Well, active learning, suppose you're trying to train a classifier that's distinguishing between birds and humans. And suppose you've trained this classifier using three pictures of birds and two pictures of humans in tuxedos. And the question active learning asks is, what is the next, next example I should label in order to best improve the classifier? And the answer to that might be, well, it might be the most disambiguating example, which might be a picture of a bird in a tuxedo. And active learning would pick this example. But what happens if your training set has mislabeled examples? What if you labeled this bird as a human? Well now, now you have to make a trade-off that didn't exist before. And that trade-off is, should I relabel this example in my training set? Or should I get a new label for an example that the classifier has never seen before? In other words, should I denoise my existing training set? Or should I expand my training set with new examples? And that's exactly reactive learning. Reactive learning is trying to understand how do we balance the training between more noisy data and less better data. Now, to further understand how relabeling affects learning, we did a little experiment. We looked at 12 data sets from the UCI machine learning repository, and we simulated workers that are 55% accurate. That is, these workers are very slightly better than random. And we compared a bunch of different strategies for training these classifiers. So we compared unilabeling, that is, uh, labeling every single example once, and we tried relabeling strategies. So for instance, taking a third of the examples and la labeling each of them three times, or taking a fifth of the examples and labeling each of them five times. And what we found was that unilabeling was better in over half the data set. And this was extremely surprising to us, right? Because people don't do this. People don't unilabel, especially when the workers are 55% accurate. And so we wanted to learn a little bit more. And after thinking really hard, we found sort of three characteristics of learning problems that would suggest that strategies with more relabeling might be better. And these three characteristics are classifiers with weak inductive bias, moderately accurate workers, and small budgets. Now, I won't have time to talk to you about any of these, but I would like to give you at least a little bit of intuition about why Classifiers with weak inductive bias would suggest strategies with relabeling would do better. So, suppose that you're trying to learn this concept that everyone 65 and older is a senior citizen. And now suppose you throw in some noise. Now, suppose that you're learning a strong inductive bias classifier, that is, one with low expressiveness low expressiveness, so for instance, a linear classifier like logistic regression. Well, you see basically that it's going to get the decision boundary pretty much correct. The noise doesn't affect it because the noise will get averaged out. But 
Suppose you're trying to learn a weak inductive bias classifier, one with high expressiveness, so for instance, a decision tree. You'll bas you see that it will basically overfit the noise. And this suggests that you have to go and relabel examples in your training set so that your classifier, your weak inductive bias classifier, doesn't overfit the noise. And so we have that weaker inductive bias increases relabeling power. So if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing with reactive learning, please come see us at our poster. Thanks.